Women have always been powerful. We believe in a world where people of all genders transform companies, lead families, and push society forward. In this world, children see women CEOs everywhere. 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 This crisis has shown us that the world needs women. More women. More women. Front and center. And when the world is uncertain, we have never been more certain that women need to lead the way. We're an organization uniting powerful women leaders. We're not waiting for a seat at the table. We are building our own. Individually, we can take steps towards progress in this new normal. But together, we can create a future that's even better than the one that we left behind. Women have always been powerful. Women have always been powerful. At Chief, we expand their power. We unite women at the highest levels. We drive women to the top and keep them there. And in this world we're building, it's never lonely at the top. There's never been a more important time for women to come together. Chief was built for this moment. There has never been a better time to be a Chief. I am 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 chief. I am chief. I am a chief. I am a chief. I am a chief. We are chief. Don't tell me I can't sit where I want. Don't tell me I can't be an inventor. Don't tell me I can't be a soldier. Don't tell me I can't be a movie star. I am Anna Mae Wong. I am Rosa Parks. I refuse to give up my bus seat to a white person. I am Tabitha Babbitt. I invented the circular saw. Don't tell me I can't fly. Don't tell me I can't be an explorer. I am Sacagawea. Don't tell me I can't be a scientist. I'm Gertie Teresa Corey. I won a Nobel Prize in Physiology. I am Deborah Sampson. Don't tell me I can't open my own business. I'm Estee Lauder. I started a global empire that now has $7 billion in annual sales. I disguised myself as a man to fight in the Revolutionary War. Don't tell me I can't be a spy. Don't tell me I can't be a journalist. I am Mary Elizabeth Bowser. I'm Amelia Earhart. I starred in over 40 films from the silent era to the talkies. I am Hobita Idar. I was an editor, a publisher, and I even founded my own newspaper. During the Civil War, I was a maid for the Confederate president. He thought I was illiterate, but I actually had a photographic memory. I was shot twice in my first battle and removed the bullets myself. These are just some of the women who have changed history. Don't let them be forgotten. Become a member and support the National Woman's History Museum. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Kamala Harris has been immortalized in a massive sheet of glass. The National Women's History Museum unveiled this portrait of Harris at the Lincoln Memorial today. The so-called glass ceiling breaker. Is meant to symbolize the first female vice president breaking the glass ceiling. A Swiss artist named Simon Berger used a hammer to painstakingly create tiny cracks of the glass. Visitors are saying that it looks like magic and that it represents hope. You know, it really represents the best in America. It represents the future, and it represents the values that we hold dear. And it looks like the art is getting a stamp of approval from the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. Vice President Kamala Harris is on the But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. Every little girl watching tonight sees that this is a country of possibilities.
welcome and happy International Women's Day. Thank you for joining the latest BBH New York Barn Bur Burner series, Glass Ceiling Breakers. My name is Amani Duncan, and I am the president of BBH New York and your moderator tonight. As a reminder, the Barn Burner series is a virtual gathering in which we scan the landscape for fellow creatives and cultural disruptors, sparking rich and provocative discussions across multiple disciplines. Now, by definition, glass ceiling is a metaphor used to represent an invisible barrier that keeps a given group from rising beyond a certain level in hierarchy. The glass ceiling is so named because it is a point beyond which women cannot reach or a ceiling on their advancement. The ceiling is obviously made of glass because the women can see beyond it. I recently read a study given by the Peterson Institute for International uh, Economics. They basically surveyed about 22,000 firms globally and their findings um, were quite on point in my <laughs> humble opinion. They basically were able to show that there's increasing evidence that women in, in executive positions and on corporate boards can have a positive impact on a company's performance. And more diverse C-suites, um, women in the C-suite studies is connected to higher margins, bigger profits, and better total return to stakeholders. Women make up half the US population that consists of about 29% of American entrepreneurs, according to the Institute for Women's Policy Research. The ability for women to build and sustain their own companies is actually critical um, for establishing gender equality in the business world. Females are 45% more likely to be fired than males in CEO positions. According to male versus female CEO statistics in 2019, it is evident that females are more likely to get the boot, no matter whether the company is performing at a higher rate. C CNBC did a, a showcase a study that included about 346 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, of which only 21 were female. It was concluded that there's a major gap in individual salaries paid. For example, um, a C CEO of Charter Communications earned an annual compensation of about 99 million compared to IBM's female CEO with an annual comp uh, compensation of about 32 million. So there is a lot of work to be done, but there are trailblazers. We walk in the shadow of greatness, women who actually broke through the virtual glass ceilings. Shirley Chisholm, Sandra Day, um, Hillary Clinton, Madeleine Albright, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Carol Mosley Braun. I mean, the list just goes on and on and we cannot forget our Vice President Kamala Harris. So without further ado, because we do wanna get into this, this timely and important topic, I, I want to introduce our panel. So Lindsay Kaplan, my dear friend, and she's also the co-founder of Chief. Lindsay, uh, like I said, is the co-founder and also the chief brand officer of Chief, the leadership network dedicated to connecting and supporting women executives. Prior to Chief, Lindsay joined the founding team of Casper, where she served as VP of Communication and Brand for four years. Lindsay has been named New York Times Deal Book Groundbreaker, PR Weeks 40 Under 40, Brand Innovators 40 Under 40, and Business Insiders Most Innovative CMOs in the World. So please welcome to Barn Burners, my dear friend, Lindsay Kaplan. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Imani. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be Thanks. a great conversation. I agree. I can't wait to get into it. So our next panelist is Jennifer Herrera, and Jennifer is the Vice President of External Affairs for the National Women's History Museum. As the museum's Chief Communications Officer, she, overse she oversees currently public affairs, marketing, partnerships, and media relations. She most recently spearheaded the museum's Women Vote, Women Win initiative, which explored the historical context of the 19th 
Amendment, the critical work that continued after its passage to ensure all women had the right to vote and contemporary issues around voting through programming, partnerships, resources, conversations, and voter engagement activities. Now, prior to joining the National Women's History Museum, Jennifer worked to expand across, uh, expand access and opportunity to higher education as the Director of Communications for the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Prior to her work in higher education, Jennifer spearheaded film projects for the LGBTQ Victory Fund, which is a national organization dedicated to electing openly LGBTQ people who can further equality at all levels of government. So please welcome Jennifer Herrera to the Barn Burner series. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So our next panelist is someone that I have known for, gosh, maybe, I don't know, over 15 years, I think. Uh, her name is Kamala Avila Salmon. Uh, Kamala, or Kamala, sorry, sorry, we get it all confused. <laughs> We get it confused with our new vice president, but Kamala was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and she immigrated to New York City as a child. Um, after pursuing her BA and then MBA from Harvard University, she moved to Los Angeles with the goal of diversifying the powerful images and messages disseminated by Hollywood. Such important work. She has worked across music, movie, TV, streaming entertainment, and led marketing camp campaigns for Janelle Monet, The Voice, Red Table Talk, just to name a few. After working in tech at Google, YouTube TV, and Facebook, where she was named one of Adweek's 2019 Young Influentials. Now today, Kamala joins us from Lionsgate as the Motion Picture Group's first head of inclusive content, a role aimed at developing and implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and strategies to increase and reflect global diversity in Lionsgate's film entertainment. Kamala is also very outspoken um, voice on issues of race, racism and anti-blackness, pinning several medium articles on DEI in the workplace and in the entertainment industry specifically. She is the host of the successful podcast, From Woke to Work, The Anti-Racist Journey. She is also, gosh, on the board, uh, co-chair of the Alliance Young Professionals Board, which supports a charter school network in Los Angeles, working with some of the city's most under-resourced neighborhoods. So please join me in welcoming my friend Kamala to the Barn Burner Hi. stage. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And every time I hear my bio read, I'm like, oh my God, must shorten. Thank you. <laughs> No, it's good. Listen, I am a big fan, as everyone knows, of reading people's bios because, you know, your journey is important and yeah. it should be recognized. Absolutely. We, we need to do that more as women. Um, so thank you for being here. Yeah. Next to the panel is Jackie, our very own BBHer, Jackie Anzaldi. Um, Jackie is a graduate of FIT with a BFA in advertising design. She is currently a creative director and art director at right here at BBH New York, which we're so happy to have her, where she helps lead creative on global tech uh, giant in Samsung Electronics. And before joining BBH, Jackie was behind the highly celebrated Oreo Daily Twist campaign that brought the first LGBTQ plus cookie to the world that earned her numerous personal and professional accolades, including the coveted Cyber Grand Prix Cannes Lion. Woo. She has been named 24th most creative person in advertising now and ranks number nine um, in the top 30 most creative people in social media, uh, respectively by Business Insider and has won virtually every major industry award. We're so happy to have her. Jackie is guided by a single principle to put good things out in the world, a belief that extends to all of her creative pursuits and endeavors. Um, when Jackie is away from Zoom, oh, she loves to travel <laughs> with her husband, Chris, and care for her two newly adopted foster dogs. Um, 
chill with her Siberian cats, Nancy and Gladys, and tries to execute vegan recipes without, <laughs> without a terrible result. So I'm with you, Jackie. It's all about <laughs> vegan meals. Um, so welcome, Jackie, um, our BBHer to the Barn Burner stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And last but not least is another BBHer, um, Liz Laudy, who is joining us today. Um, she is a creative director right here at BBH New York, where she started out as a copywriter. And then over the last four years, she's worked on brands such as Samsung, American Express, Seamless, PlayStation, No Kid Hungry, and Plan Parenthood. Before BBH, Liz worked at RGA on brands such as Samsung, Nike, and Verizon. She holds a Bachelor, a bachelor of Arts in English um, from the College of William and Mary and a master, Master's in Business and Copywriting from the Brand Center, which is part of Virginia's Commonwealth University. She's the proud dog mom of Plot, <laughs> a hound mix rescue um, called Carl. We love dog mommies. So welcome to the family, Liz. Thank you for thank joining you. us. So yeah, welcome to intro, everyone. Carl. Oh my gosh, of course, it's all about highlighting the amazing glass ceiling breakers that we know and hopefully will inspire others. So let's get right into it. This really healthy conversation that I know we're all very excited about. So just to go back a little bit, let's talk about the Glass Sailing Breaker project. Um, and everyone saw the amazing case study. We're just so humbled and proud of, uh, of, our, of our part in this, uh, in this incredible project. So BBH, in partnership with Chief and the National Women's History Museum, debuted the Glass Ceiling Breaker Portrait, which was an homage to our amazing Vice President, Kamala Harris. It was on display in Washington, D.C., right in front of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, early uh, February from the 4th to the 6th. And as everyone knows, we even had the vice president come and visit it in her own unique way with all of her security around her. <laughs> and even the uh, second gentleman, uh, her husband, came to visit it on his own. So just exceeding all of our uh, all of our expectations. Um, and Liz and Jackie are the female creative team that played a very instrumental role in the project. So I wanna kick it off with them. Jackie, can you share with us, like how did this project come about? Sure. Um, the idea kind of came about because, you know, we saw an opportunity to pay <clears throat> homage to our new vice president, you know, and her amazing glass ceiling shattering achievement. You know, it's like, such an important moment in our history and it really, you know, deserved to be celebrated. So, um, you know, we did some research and we found this really awesome, super unique kind of artist, um, Simon Berger, and he's from Switzerland. And he's like the only artist in the world who kind of makes these types of portraits made from broken glass. He literally has a hammer, as you saw in the video, and he, you know, just makes these beautiful portraits by like hammering it. And, and we just loved that um, technique and thought that it was conceptually perfect for this kind of, you know, idea. And we also wanted, you know, the location to be really meaningful. So, you know, we chose the Lincoln Memorial, you know, not only because it's super iconic and gorgeous as just a backdrop, but also it's a place that um, Martin Luther King gave his famous, I have a dream speech. So we loved that symbolism and just the meaning behind all of it. We just thought it kind of made it a little that more, much more powerful, you know? Yeah. Um, but this yeah. project was like definitely a labor of love and dedication. We, we literally had like a small army. We had a, like a team, a BBH, everyone worked really hard and loved it. And amazing like production um, company, Missing Pieces you know, the National Women's History Museum and Chief, like everyone had to come together to make it all happen. And like the result, the responses were like everything. So it was so awesome. So incredible, so incredible. And I'm, and I'm also really glad that you both, you know, worked on it um, because it just, I think it holds meaning for everyone, but for, you know, especially for women and for those young girls that we saw. Um, so I'm so glad that you and Jackie were able to to work on this. Um, so uh, you and Liz, I'm so sorry. So Liz, let's let's talk about you for a minute. I mean, your portfolio is filled with just such incredible top brands: Amex, Delta, Seamless, Amazon, to just name a few. So, what was your personal experience like working on a project 
like glass ceiling breaker that would, you know, that will be memorialized for years to come. So different from the other projects that you've, you've worked on. Oh, indeed. I think with, um, when it comes to creatives, um, most of the time when we have projects like the ones you mentioned, um, the drive to make creative work, like great creative work, um, big productions, all of that, it comes um, from a bit of a selfish space. Um, it's all like for the agency or for our personal portfolios, to be quite honest. But this project was different because it had such a cultural significance that it came from a bit more of a selfless place. And I think from my, my perspective and also everyone that touched it. Um, this is a project that, you know, it was built, of, built out of generosity from the production company, from the team here at BBH um, and from our two amazing partners. Everyone already has their day-to-day -day jobs. And this one just, it really struck a deep chord with everyone of, it's something that it's a huge historical moment that it means so much for, for women, for girls, and everyone probably like thinks about themselves as a woman or women in their lives or girls like my niece and how it can actually impact. And being a part of that story was really important to everyone that worked on this. Um, it's not every day you get to work on a project like this with such cultural significance. Um, a bit more than like a credit card brief or a phone brief or something that is great and fun and an amazing challenge but this one I mean it touched people and it inspired people and the reactions were incredible to follow um we saw pictures of young girls um interacting with the portrait just staring at it kind of in wonder and that was that was priceless um a girl made a trip to go see it for a 10th birthday um women were saying how they were tearing up to see it and then um I copied and pasted one of my favorite comments because it was so powerful and quote um this is the most powerful installation on the washington national mall right now why is it up for only two days we asked the same question sorry where will it be going and will there be a permanent location for it asking for all the women all the people of color whose ancestors made great sacrifices to be part of american democracy and still need a reason to believe in that and that sent chills down everyone's spines uh, we were on slack just oh, following cool. it and someone posted that and it was just like oh my god we're you don't get a reaction like that from from our the day-to-day -day production the, um, the stuff that we do um just in our normal you know agency lives so it was it was it was incredible um it's the the reactions like that the message that this piece this project conveyed um, about the glass ceilings um making that message a bit more known that a big one got broken, but there, there's still more out there, and That's that right. we all have to lift each other up and like continue to continue to break more. Um, so this is like a really great historical moment, but there are definitely more to come. And so I was just so proud to be a part of that with everyone involved. Oh, I mean, you said it so beautifully. I was so emotional as well as everyone just to see, I, I don't know, the, the young girls were the ones that impacted me the most, you know, oh, to see, sure. yeah. oh, just to follow that, those, their stories and to see their expressions was just, uh, it was a game changer. It reminds us why we're, we're in this business and how lucky we are to be able to do this type of work, you know, so Thank you both. Thank you, Jackie and, and Liz for sharing and, and taking us through uh, what that experience was for you. Um, Lindsay, dear Lindsay, my friend, you are the co-founder of Chief, as we said earlier, and you and your business partner, Carolyn Childers, um, created this amazing space designed specifically for women executives uh, to strengthen their experience in the C-suite, cross-pollinate, um, powers across industries and affect change from the top down. As a founding member, I can attest that it is one of the best like decisions I've ever made for my uh, professional career, but also for my personal journey as well. Um, and so I can attest that you are always suited up and ready to call the play. Um, and I think before we go any further into this discussion, we would be remiss to not share the story of how this partnership was formed. It was not all smooth sailing. 
Um, and it really demonstrated the power of what women can do when we come together. So um, if you don't mind, I would love to take us through this story. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, Liz and Jackie and the the small army behind this project were working so diligently. Um, and we, we had partnered with a nonprofit. Um, but then in kind of the 25th hour, the nonprofit felt uncomfortable with the tone and the tenor of the project um, and how closely our debut was to the, to the insurrection. Um, and so they backed out and we were in a bit of a panic because um, everything was in jeopardy at that point. We definitely needed to bring in a nonprofit. So the timeline was in jeopardy. Um, emotions, as you can imagine, were just sky high. Um, and so I remember sitting on a, a business call internally talking about this and you know, Chief and Lindsay popped in my head and I was like, okay, let me hang up and let me make some phone calls. And Lindsay was my first phone call. And I really just humbly presented it to her to say, do you know of any nonprofits that could come on board in such a short amount of time? And Lindsay said, and I'll turn it over to you, Lindsay. Yeah, <laughs> it was so funny. I, that day I had just had my eyes dilated, but I couldn't see anything. So I couldn't even read your email. I had like zoomed in on on the email to call you and i quickly watched the video i hadn't even read and seen about the art and i saw the film first mm -hmm. and it I immediately just choked up it was just such a powerful incredible um work of art message celebration and so the second i saw it i i looked at it and i said i want this like this is what chief needs to be doing we hadn't been doing a lot of marketing um chief as an organization for the last two years we have been focused on the member experience first and foremost just really spending all of our time our energy or resources making sure that members are loving their experience and truthfully purposefully neglected a little bit of of some you know outside marketing and i think some of that to be really transparent was a conflict of never wanting to be performative and wanting to make sure that we were not um using feminism as a brand it's really opposed to what we stand for and what we do and so when you sent that that uh, that message to me and i saw that video it was an immediate like we need to do this I, I i i like stood up in my chair and almost fell over and so when we spoke on the phone i said like let like i would love for chief to 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 move this forward put chief on this this is what we stand for we happen to be launching in dc in a week so it could not be more perfect um and so that's fine enough, which is back to chief found the amazing Jessica Tillier, who is on the board of the National Women's History Museum. And this came together within, I think, 48 hours. And so Literally. we were so happy to meet Jen and to just really come together and rally. I cannot think of another uh, nonprofit, another, another organization that we wanted to partner with so badly to present this incredible art. So so thank you for calling me and Jennifer, thank you for picking up our call. Exactly. I mean, it was literally a perfect storm and it just shows you like the power of women and the power of chief um, that you can tap into this gold mine of, of resources and connections and we just, you know, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm a little biased, but women, we just get it done. We really do. And we, we're, we're so laser focused on whatever the objective is. And, and, you know, even when it seems like daunting and we're just like, oh my gosh, you know, how can we move this rock up this, this mountain? We, we seem to always find a way to do it. Um, so thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, for, for coming on board. Um, in the 25th hour, uh, it probably was later than that, but it just sounds good to say 25th hour. Um, but Lindsay, let's talk a little bit about Chief. So I joined about oh, just under two years ago. 
um, in New York. I found my tribe. It, again, it was just the best thing that I that I did for myself. Um, and you know, regardless of the industry, I find that the boys club still exists, and the quantity of businesses that take place at you know all male settings, such as private you know, clubs, golf clubs, et cetera, it still happens. So mm -hmm. my question to you is, can you share with everyone the motivation you and your business partner, Carolyn, had when you decided to create Chief? Yeah, absolutely. And I think these days, it's less about those private clubs. I think most men I know aren't playing golf, and there are plenty of women who do. It's really about the uh, camaraderie. You know that expression we hear a lot, like, oh, he's a good guy. That doesn't, yeah. there's no equivalent, right? There is no, she's a good girl, throw her on the board, right? And so founding Chief came from a really personal place for me and my co-founder. We were in similar positions. We were climbing up the ranks in our companies. Um, I was a VP. Um, she was essentially acting as COO without the title, another familiar story to many women. Um, we found ourselves giving we were mentoring we were taking coffees we were responding to people who were looking for time um, and within my own organization i unofficially became de facto mentor to a lot of women um, and i loved it I, I enjoy having conversations i love helping people i'll always get a coffee if i can fit into my schedule um, and i realized i didn't have a mentor and I had spent so much time giving of myself that there were so many challenges that I wasn't equipped to face as a VP that I was coming into for the first time. And those challenges were really important. These were affecting the company. This was affecting, you know, giant budgets that I felt, um, imposter syndrome is probably not the right word, but I felt really alone. And I didn't have a group of people I could turn to who got it. It was either an executive coach who was very expensive and didn't really get the nitty gritty, but could help me with my mindset. Um, or it was friends and family that also I could vent to, but there was no help. And so that really was the, the seed of the foundation of what later became Chief, which was looking for a group of women who were in leadership positions, who could co-mentor one another, who could be around different roles, different industries, different functions, and bring in the cognitive diversity to share with one another challenges, to support one another, and to make sure that as we climb the ladder, we are kind of anchored together to, to form a, a stronger bond as we grow and lift more women up. So we were excited that you joined us early on and I love hearing these stories because this is what we created Chief to do. Absolutely. And, and I think we got another chief person in this group too, <laughs> Kamala. Um, it's just, it's, I can't be, you know, I speak about chief all the time. I'm just, I consider myself a brand ambassador. Um, and I'm, you know, when I look back on those two years with my, with my group and with everyone there and, and building the relationship with you. And I think about all the things that I went through, you know, all the transition that I was going through, um, Chief was right there with me. So thank you and Carolyn for creating um, this incredible, this incredible space for all of us to grow and to learn from. So Jennifer, hi. So I want to hear from you. I mean, you're, you know, you're the executive vice president of external affairs at the National Women History Museum in Washington, D.C. I don't think most people realize, I, I didn't even realize that you guys are 100% online, which is simply incredible. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And then also, like, you know, we came to you with our hat in our hand and you and Holly immediately jumped on board for this glass breaker, uh, glass ceiling breaker project. So why was it important for the museum to come on board? And um, I would love to hear about the future plans of the museum, if you, whatever you can share. Sure, um, you know, this, this moment in history is so incredible to finally have a woman seated as vice president, you know, after, 
the 2016 election, I knew many women in their late 70s who were devastated that they never thought they'd see anyone as president in their lifetime. They thought Hillary was their shot, right? And, and so they kind of gave up on the idea of it. And so to have a woman now, four years later, serving as vice president, you know, is, is truly incredible. And for us as a, as a museum, we believe two things, inclusive history is good history and representation matters. And so this project was such a good fit for us because it really embodies those values. It's representation matters. And I mean, I, I just, I tear up even thinking about it because it was so powerful. Like it was powerful as a concept and that film that you spoke about, Lindsay, was so powerful. But then when you see it in person it, it, at the Lincoln, it was so, such an incredible um, tangible manifestation of these values and of the urgency of representation and to have that on display was just, it was really meaningful as a woman. It was really meaningful as a mom of three boys, three young boys to go and see this. And uh, so we really wanted to join because first of all, the art is amazing, really great partners. And um, we couldn't think of a better way to really exemplify in this moment in time what this accomplishment truly means for the representation of women. Yes. And all of the glass ceilings that have been broken up to that point, of course, you know, <laughs> that's what is also yeah. so cool about this project is it's not just Kamala, it's also all of the women that came before that chipped that right. ceiling time after time after time again to get right. us to this point. It's not one woman. It's, you know, I, I rem reminded of that gif where you see the women pulling up women and they're standing on each other's shoulders. That's what that portrait meant to me. Absolutely. And I think that's what it meant to our museum. Oh. Thank you again for coming on board um, and being such a great partner. So what are the future plans for the museum? We, Is it like, sure. Well, like you said, we've, we've existed for 25 years as a virtual museum. Amazing. And if you wouldn't mind, I'll tell a quick story about that. There, yes. when uh, the 19th Amendment passed, there was actually a statue of suffrag suffragists in the Capitol Rotunda. They had a big celebration. I think this was, um, I, I guess in August, 1920, they had a big celebration in the Capitol. And then that suffrage statue promptly got moved to what is known as the Capitol Crypt. So like this milestone, and then the women disappeared. And so that was kind of the impetus for us to, to start this museum. Like where is the representation in, uh, in history and certainly in, a public, um, in public anywhere really. Wow. But so that was the impetus. And so we, we have fought really hard for many years to bring representation, to make history accessible, to make women's history accessible and tell a more complete story. So we do that through a lot of virtual programming as an online museum, we have virtual exhibits, uh, hundreds of biographies of women past and present. We have teacher, you know, resources for teachers and educator, um, educate learners, excuse me, young learners, general audiences. And now we're really working on finally opening our doors to a home in DC in 2022. So we'll have an announcement um, relatively, you know, coming up, but we're really excited to actually have a home where we can share women's history and all the meanwhile, still provide these resources because if COVID has taught us anything is that, you know, um, how can we reach more people? How can we get right. history um, beyond Washington across, the, across really the world because it's not just an episodic, um, you know, problem. We need to bring this into the fabric of our national narrative. And so that's what we're setting out to do both virtually and in person. Amazing. I cannot wait. I'll be there I with bells wait. on. <laughs> I know in 2021, 2020, what, two, I'll be there. This yes. To this panel live. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be vaccinated and everything will be great and we'll do a panel live. I love it. Thank you, Jennifer. Wait, so let's say one little thing, Amani. Uh, yes, sorry. please. 
we brought the statue back up to the Capitol. I forgot that part of it. It's now back in the rotunda and that was the great work of our founders. So amazing. The Capitol rotunda, it's there. That's right. That's right. Amazing. Keep the good work going. We need it.